G'day, I'm Scotty Tucker, and in this series I'm taking my 20 plus years of experience working with water and shrinking it down into bite-sized educational videos to help you better manage your water body. So if you want to learn how to manage your water body better, hit the subscribe button below. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about how to clear a muddy dam, or as it's commonly called, flocking. So before we go into how you treat the water, I guess we should first talk about why it's muddy in the first place. Now this is going to be very unpleasant for a lot of you because I'm going to take you back to your high school chemistry days and what a nightmare. I hated high school chemistry. Anyway, um, if my teacher could see me now, she'd be telling me I told you you'd use chemistry in your normal life, so hats off to her, she was right. Anyway, so why a dam is muddy is normally because the soil particles, and again going back to your chemistry days, if you look at uh, your atomic charges of things, and of atoms and molecules, you have uh, ionic charges that are positive or negative. And what happens is that you have these really small soil particles that have the same ionic charge. So if you've got, for example, soil particles that are both positively charged, it means that they're staying in suspension because these charges are just butting up against each other and they're not allowing the soil particles to sink. So that's essentially what flocking is in a nutshell, is that you figure out what the best product is to use that's going to add an opposing charge to those suspended soil particles and you add the flocculant and it makes the soil particle heavy enough that it sinks. Now the issue with that, or the, the consideration with that, is that you really need to look at why it's like that in the first place. So in a lot of cases you can dig out a dam and it's muddy from the start because that's just the nature of the soil and there's not really much you can do about it. Um, so the best thing to do when you dig a new dam is just leave it for a while and see if it settles itself. Um, if it doesn't settle itself then you might need to then start investigating uh, flocking. Other reasons why you might get muddy dams is that uh, it might actually in time settle on its own if it was uh, in, good, in good condition to do so. And what I mean by that is that if you have really shallow uh, areas of your dam, uh, it means that you're going to get a lot of wind and wave action, which is potentially going to constantly be stirring up the muddy bottom, on the, uh, the muddy water on the bottom. So that probably means that it's not a good candidate for flocking and clearing because it's just going to come back. And it's very important that you look at all these issues because there's no point in spending your money on flocking or clearing a dam if you haven't addressed the underlying issues and it's going to come back again with muddy water relatively quickly. So erosion uh, from the bottom in shallow water is a key factor. Another one is erosion of the banks. So if you have unvegetated or just bare earth banks on the side of the dam, it means that when you get the prevailing wind that's going to be bashing up against that bank, that the soil from the banks is going to start uh, coming back into the water and muddying, muddying up the water. And that's also going to potentially cause your issues with erosion. So you should always plant out your banks with non-invasive plant species or put down riprap, uh, which is basically just, uh, just gravel, um, large gravel, sort of you know, fist size gravel and larger. Um, so that when the, the wind and wave action does buffer or batter against your, your dam, that, that acts as a buffer and takes the, uh, the risk of erosion out. Other things that can cause your dam to muddy up are animals. So that can come from, uh, from stock. If you've got cattle or horses or sheep accessing the dam, you want to keep them out because they're just going to be getting into the dam, stirring up the mud, making your water muddy. But the other thing that they're doing that you don't want going on in your dam is they're crapping everywhere. So that crap, animal crap, is going to eventually lead to pollution problems and encourage algae, algae to grow. So there's going to be other issues there that you need to um, uh, address when it comes to animals. So the best thing is to keep animals out of the dam and just stick in a little pump. You can get solar pumps now and a water trough and just, uh, you know, let your animals drink from troughs rather than in the dam itself. Other animals that can cause issues with, with muddy dams are, are yabbies. Uh, yabbies will burrow, so uh, it's okay to have a few yabbies, they shouldn't cause an issue, but if you've got a dam with, with loads and loads of yabbies, you're likely to end up with turbidity problems with muddy water. So it's a good idea, as best you can, to trap them, um, purge them for a couple of days in some fresh water and then have yourself a good feed. Uh, just keep the number of, numbers of yabbies down quite low. Uh, other Animals that can cause issue are carp. So if you've got carp that's naturally come in from a dam, maybe you're in a chain of ponds from a creek that's overflowed or something like that, uh, you really do need to, to try your best to get the carp out. I know it's nearly impossible, but uh, there are ways and means that you can try and get them out. So try and get them out as best you can. Uh, and whatever you do, don't put the carp in your dam. They just cause so many problems. Carp, by their natural feeding behaviour, they actually uh, suck water in 
uh, through their mouths and try and push it out through their gills and they have these things called gill rakers and they try and filter all the, the material that they want to feed off out of these gill rakers. So it's a natural feeding behaviour to actually extract uh, muddy water and sift it through um, and then spit it out and move on to the, to the next, next area. So they're always going to be dirty and up your dam. Uh, and that's the same with koi. Uh, koi are essentially carp, so you certainly shouldn't stop koi in an earthen dam because they're also going to breed like rabbits and, and, and end up causing you issues further down the track. So, uh, and also when it comes to erosion, you want to make sure that with any gullies or uh, streams, wherever the, the water's coming in, that that's also well uh, vegetated or uh, has rocks and root wrap so that it slows down and hopefully lets the, uh, the soil part will settle out before it hits the dam. So there are some of the things that you need to think about before you go and flock because, like I said, there's no point in flocking if you haven't addressed these issues and the next big rain that you get, you end up with a bunch of muddy water again. And a very easy way to tell if, uh, if you do have issues with uh, needing to flock uh, or if you just have issues with erosion and wind and wave action and animals causing uh, the turbidity is to just grab yourself a, a Coke bottle, an old Coke bottle, a uh, clear bottle and just fill it up with your, uh, with your dam water and just stick it on your desk or in your windowsill in your kitchen and leave it sit there for about a week or so. And if that water clears on its own, then it's likely that your issues are not the soil particles in the dam, but it's rather that the, uh, the erosion or some of the animal issues that we've just mentioned are uh, actually causing the, the water to, to, to cloud up and, turn it and, and become turbid. So uh, if it doesn't clear, then it suggests that you do need to take an action in terms of introducing the flocculent in order to, to, to give it a helping hand because it's unlikely to clear on its own. Now when it comes to the types of flocculants that are available, there are several options. Uh, there are alum based products which is aluminium sulphate and they can come in powders and, and liquids. Uh, there are special blends of aluminium uh, pro based products that, uh, that we mostly use and the reason why we use special blends is that your, your stock standard alum based products uh, and any aluminium uh, based product for that matter is somewhat dependent on pH and your traditional stock standard alum type products are likely to reduce your pH suddenly, especially if you go a little bit beyond what you actually needed to dose. And that can be problematic for, for any aquatic animals and aquatic life that's in, there, in the system because no animal likes to have the pH drop suddenly. So you do have to be extremely careful if you're using just stock standard alum. Uh, and you should measure your pH and your alkalinity. And in some cases you may need to increase your alkalinity because alkalinity acts as a buffer for pH, which means that if you've got soft water or low alkalinity water, uh, it, it means that you're at more risk of your pH dropping suddenly. So you may need to do some pH correction by using lime uh, before you do your, uh, your, your, your alum based um, uh, application. Now the, the products that, uh, the special blends of, of, of alum, uh, have a much wider safety margin before it starts impacting your pH. So that's essentially why we use those products rather than the, the old school alum type products that, uh, that are still used. Uh, you also need to look at the, at the application method. Is it easier for you to use a powder or a liquid? Uh, in most cases it's easier, easier to use a liquid. Um, other products that can be used is you, you can use lime yourself. Uh, normally you'd, you'd use it in the form of gypsum. Uh, gypsum can be quite effective uh, as a flocculant. Generally you, use, you can use more product uh, using gypsum than the alum, alum based products, but gypsum is a, a common, product, common product to use. And you can also use uh, polymers, and polymers are basically long chain molecules that have uh, many more receptor sites for these ionic charges to latch onto compared to uh, the other types of products, which means that you end up using much less product. Uh, the polymer based products can be a bit more expensive, but they can be a bit easier to apply and, and use lower doses. So uh, it can be a bit courses for courses. Uh, and the other th important thing. Uh, to understand is that unfortunately uh, whilst we can always try and do our best and, and do some testing and get down to a, uh, a recommendation, sometimes it just doesn't work. Uh, sometimes you can do uh, jar testing I'm just about to show you uh, in the lab and just not, not get a result. Uh, so you do have to sort of be working with someone who has more than one tool available to them because if the alum based products don't work, you try the gypsum. If the gypsum based products don't work, you try the alum. If none, none of them work, you try the polymers and so on. So it can be a bit of a, 
a challenging process to reach the point where you find the product that, that works uh, and then obviously you've got to um, apply it in, a, in an appropriate way based on the product that you, that you do select. Now one of the, the, the important things I want to mention is that there's a, an old cow cocky's uh, tale that you can use hay to clear up muddy dams and it's actually true. But the problem with you, and the, the reason why hay works is that uh, as the hay breaks down and degrades in the water, it releases organic acids and these uh, also latch onto those ionic charged soil particles and, and cause them to, to settle out. So it is possible to clear uh, a muddy dam using hay. Problem is, it's, it's nigh on impossible to try and figure out a way of testing how much hay you're actually going to need to use. And you know, so you inevitably end up, end up using much more or much less than you might use. But the main problem with it is that what you're doing by introducing hay into your dam is that you're introducing an organic material that over time will degrade and break down and start rotting and then it will fall down to the bottom of the dam and just become a compost rich organic source of nutrients to feed algae and weed. So it's never a good idea to introduce uh, organic material such as hay into your dam. We spend most of our time addressing organic overload uh, in dams and, and tackling nutrients that are feeding algae and weed. So the, just don't use hay. Uh, although yes, it potentially can work, it's not worth the, uh, the, the negative effects that it brings as well. Now in terms of working out what's the best type of flocculant and to give you an idea of how much product you're actually going to need in your dam, we do some tests that are called jar tests. Now in the lab you'd use a, a pretty fancy jar tester which is a mechanic device that, that does it a lot better than, uh, than one, what I'm going to show you now. But it's important to, uh, for you guys to learn just how you can do this sort of thing at home, albeit uh, at a basic level. So help you figure out on your own if you, if you can actually use a flocculant successfully or not. So this is a system that you would use with, uh, with whatever flocculant you want to try. In this case we're going to be using one of our special blend of uh, alum based products and what you do is you get a, uh, a, some product in a, uh, in a diluted form uh, at a sort of rate that you think you might be close to using and that's something that we you wouldn't go into uh, on this video, you, you'd sort of contact your, your, local, your local guy, your local supplier or give us a call and we can, we can help you figure that out. But you narrow down the type of product that you're going to use and you get it in a diluted form and then basically you just take a, uh, a little um, pipette type of measuring uh, device, it's just a little dropper, you can get these from the local chemist, just tells you how many mil you're using and all what you do is just take a, uh, a, known, reason, uh, a known reading or known amount of material, in this case we're going to try uh, doses of 1 mil, 2 mil and 3 mil and you can see behind me I've got some sample jars there that are all a litre. You don't need to use uh, chemistry beakers, you can use anything at all, you can use bottles, you can use uh, glasses, you can use buckets if you want to, uh, just as long as you know the volume that's in them and it's easy to work with 1 litre samples. So uh, a litre sample is the easiest way to, um, uh, to extrapolate how much product you're going to use. And also, important thing uh, when you are taking your samples out of your dam to get to this point where you're testing, it's a good idea to take the samples, uh, you, know, you know, you want to have about probably 10, 15 litres worth of, worth of product. If you're sending it into someone else to do the testing for you, it's a good idea to send them that much product so that you've got enough to play around with different doses and different products. But it's also a good idea to take the sample from different points around the dam. Uh, because if you go and, and stand at it, in one spot in your dam, especially what can happen is if you put your foot in the water, you cloudy up the water, you put your bottle in right next to where you, where you put your foot in, and you're just dragging in water that may not be as turbid as the sample that you've just taken. So take it from a few spots around the dam just to give you a, a better sort of um, a more rounded, realistic uh, view or, or sample of how much crap's in the, uh, in the water, how much shorts in the water. So now what we'll do is we'll just pop in the, the one mil sample and just pop it in the, into one of these. And then what we'll do is just stir that around. Just with a little stirrer, again there's uh, anything that you can use that's, that's handy that's going to do this. And just mix that for a few seconds. While I'm doing that, I'm going to grab another sample in my little dropper, uh, another diluted product um, mix out of the dropper, and that's going to be 2 mil. I'm going to drop it into this guy, and 
in a perfect world you might rinse that out, but you're going from the smaller to the higher, so it's not terribly critical. And then we'll see what two mil does. And while I'm stirring that, I'm gonna put in three mil of product for the next sample. And you may be able to see there's a jar behind me there. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. But it's also a good idea to keep an extra jar uh, handy to act as what's called a control so that you can actually see the original water and what it looks like compared to the water that you've just treated. So now we'll put 3ml in this one. And we'll stir that around. And now what we're looking for now is as this product is as the flocculant is mixed around with the sample water, what you're looking for is for small little, uh, small little particles to start forming. Uh, ideally, they start off at sort of pinhead size, and then they get larger, say to match head size, and get a bit fluffy, and then they actually start settling and sinking down. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for what's called a good flock, which is uh, a good. Um, uh, heavy particle that's going to sink down to the bottom. Now that might happen straight away or it might take a little while to happen. Uh, I've just done one, two and three. You may need to do uh, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half to really um, get a, uh, a good result. You can get a poor result if you put in too little product and you can get a poor result if you put in too much product. So unfortunately, like I said before, it's a little bit of a process. It's not sort of an easy thing where you say, okay, two, two mil doesn't work, so I'm gonna put in four mil, just double it and see if I get a quick result. It's not gonna work that way. You might find that you needed three mil and you did two and four and you didn't get a result with either side. So you need to do small incre incremental doses. And the other reason why you wanna do that as well is that when you multiply that out, at the moment you're talking about one litre samples, but let's say your dam's in the million of millions of litres, the cost difference in product between 2.5 and 2 in the jar translates out to a significant cost difference when you multiply it out for your, for your dam. So it is a good idea to take the time and, and as best you can refine your dose whilst you're at this sort of stage. So I'm not sure how well you can, uh, you can see that there. Um, I will try and bring it a little bit closer to you, but basically all three of these uh, samples are starting to flock and starting to get, um, I'm not sure if that's gonna focus well, but they are getting um, these little pinheads forming. And it's probably a little bit too soon to sort of start deciding if it's the first one, the second one, or the third one that's getting the best result. And obviously what you're hoping for is that uh, the lower dose gets you, the, gets you the best result. So what you would do now is let that settle uh, for a few hours and just see how long it actually takes to, to settle out and if it settles out completely and if so, what you think the best one actually was. Okay, so in this case you can see it's only taken a few minutes for this to be effective, uh, probably about five minutes or less. Uh, if you can see through the video there, the first one is still a bit cloudy, the one mil sample. The two mils a little less cloudy, but still a little bit cloudy nonetheless. And the third one, I wouldn't call it cloudy, I can see fine sort of particles um, floating around in the, in the water. And I would expect that as time goes on and over a period of the, the next coming hours that this would be uh, crystal clear. Now you probably also find that the 2 mil sample would also be crystal clear after a period of a few hours. So in terms of doing uh, sort of more thorough testing, what I would be doing is testing the, at least the 2.5 uh, mil mark because that's probably where this sample is actually going to come out as having the best result between uh, time and effectiveness. So that's uh, how you do your flock testing and then beyond that we need to start looking at uh, how much water you have in your dam and that's a, a case of multiplying your length and width and depth and, and doing some calculations and estimations. The important thing that when you are doing that that you understand that they are always not always unless you have a water meter that you know exactly how much uh, water went, went into your dam when you filled it. But in most cases, it's an estimate. 
So whenever you get to the point where you're estimating how much of a flocculent you're going to need, it's always a very good idea to order more, probably about 20% more, because what, will, what may happen is that if you have underestimated how much volume's in your dam, or if it hasn't been applied uh, really well or really successfully, then uh, the flocculent you make by putting in, you may need a bit more than what your jar tests uh, result. And you're, all, you're always going to get different results from your jar test to what's actually real in the field because conditions are obviously different compared to what I've just shown you um, compared to the, out, out, in your, uh, uh, out in the real world where your dam is. So it's a good idea to have more on hand because if you need to put more in, if you reach a point where you notice these fine particles starting to form in your dam and everything seems to be going well but then you run out of product and the fine particles don't make the jump from fine particles to large particles, what you'll find is that that won't clear and when it comes time then to go back and put more flocculate in, unfortunately it's never a case of uh, just topping it up with, let's say you used 100 litres of product and you run out and it didn't do the job uh, and you figured out that you probably needed say 120 litres of product, it's not as simple as just going away and getting another 20 litres of product and putting it in there. Unfortunately you need to press the reset button and go all the way back to the start again and dose with 120 litres of product. So always a good idea to have more product on hand than what you're going to need. So hopefully that's given you a, uh, an insight into uh, what causes muddy dams and the potential options that you have for, uh, for clearing them up. Uh, as always, we welcome any comments and any questions and uh, certainly any calls uh, to, to help you guys better uh, do this process on your own and help you through clearing up, uh, clearing up muddy dams. Thanks for watching. So that's a few more minutes gone by, probably about 15, 20 minutes now, and you can see that uh, as we sort of uh, checked in uh, with our first check, it seems to be the three mil sample has got the best result in this one, the two mil is pretty close, so two and a half would probably be on the money. And you can see the one mil is still a bit cloudy, uh, quite cloudy, a lot of sediment down the bottom but it's still cloudy. The uh, two mil sample has got, got more sediment down the bottom, but still a little bit cloudy, and the third is... is pretty much crystal clear even after such a uh, such a short time. So when you compare all of these to the control, which is the one that has had no treatment whatsoever, you can see just how effective these types of products can be.